The hot August day would cool by the time the French knights in the service of the King of Castile would make themselves ready and in position for the charge. Their Portuguese enemy had the high ground, but they were a ragtag agglomeration of peasants. The dregs of Lisbon, led by a bastard, hiding on a hill outside a village called Aljabahota. They had no armor to speak of. What pieces they did have were shared, so that each man wore a patchwork of items. One wore a mail shirt with no helmet, another wore a leather cuirass with no mail. The French vanguard were in such numbers and such control that they had simply rode around the bastard's army and were now lining up in formation to attack its rear, where the slope was gentler and the defenses weaker, and none of the Portuguese forces had anything to say in the matter. On a French line, pennants and coats of arms flew high and colorful in the early evening breeze. Armor shone, visors glistened. Their horses were so well outfitted that they jangled when they lifted their legs and stamped the dusty ground. The Castilians were not in the first battle line. Their King Juan had given leave for the French to lead the assault, and the glory was to be theirs. After riding all the way from France where the Hundred Years' War with the English still raged, the French were itching to show their prowess. Keen to show their mastery of the battlefield, to their Spanish allies. The Portuguese peasants, with their sticks and slings, were going to be annihilated under the hooves of the finest heavy cavalry on earth. At last, at about six o'clock, the order was given and the trumpets blew. The creeks and trees on either side of the hill laid out a perfect lane for the cavalry to start its advance like a bowling ball that could not miss. The advance turned into a charge. The cries of the few nobles on the Portuguese side for their novice infantry to hold their positions sounded strained in the wind. Soon the drumming of the hooves digging divots and throwing up earth replaced all else. Like an oncoming wave of steel and flesh, the heavy cavalry closed on its enemy. The rhythm of modern life can burden any of us with stress and anxiety. Technological advancements impact family and relationship dynamics, and the heavier workloads, cost of living and economic hardship take a toll on the well-being and mental health of all of us. To address our problems, one of the best solutions is professional therapy, which is where our sponsor BetterHelp is a great asset. BetterHelp is an online platform that makes it easy to find a therapist specifically tailored to your needs, wherever you are located in the world. It's packed with options like groupinars, journal entries, live chat, and much more. The way it works is BetterHelp asks you questions about your background, spirituality, relationship status, and other reasons you are seeking therapy, and then matches you to one of over 30,000 therapists in their network that best suits your needs, preferences, and location. BetterHelp makes taking the steps to start therapy less intimidating, and it's very easy to sign up using the link below, betterhelp.com slash historymarsh. You can communicate via phone or video chat, or even exchange messages with your therapist during the week without having to wait for your next appointment, whatever is most comfortable for you. Best yet, if you're not satisfied with your therapist, you can easily switch to a new one with a click of a button in your settings at no additional cost. Join over 4 million people who've used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life. Clicking the link below helps support my channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp to help you connect with a therapist and see if it suits you. The Iberian Peninsula that today consists almost entirely of Spain and Portugal was in the 14th century fragmented into the kingdoms of Castile and Leon, Aragon, Navarre, the Emirate of Granada, and Portugal. By the middle 1300s, the Emirates had been in retreat for two centuries, and the remaining Islamic territory of the once powerful Al-Andalus was confined to the south. <laughs> 
The Christian kingdoms of Iberia saw frequent intermarriage between their royal houses, often with an eye to co-rule, or establishing the rule of one kingdom's line over another. The roots of the Battle of al Bahata in 1385 lie in a dispute arising from one such marriage arrangement. King Ferdinand I of Portugal, who ruled from 1367 to 1383, had unsuccessfully claimed the throne of Castile along with that of Portugal, and in an effort to at least secure his royal lineage, he and the Castilians had arranged that his sole legitimate heir, Princess Beatrice, would marry King Juan I of Castile. Should the marriage result in a male child, he would inherit the thrones of both Portugal and Castile. The marriage was unpopular in Portugal, particularly in the south and with the ascendant merchant class of Lisbon, which had been excluded from the negotiations with Castile. Wars between Portugal and Castile had been common in the years preceding the marriage, and Portuguese hostility to the new regime was compounded when, on the death of Ferdinand I in 1383, the regent put in charge of the royal administration for the ten-year-old Beatrice was her mother, Leonor Tellis, a deeply unpopular figure viewed as disloyal and immoral by the populace and suspected of poisoning her husband. The political situation in Portugal itself became toxic when a challenger to the succession arrangement arose in the form of Joao of Aviz, an illegitimate brother of the departed king, Ferdinand I. Joao was young, 26 years old, handsome, wealthy, skilled in both war and diplomacy. He was also Grand Master of the Military Order of Saint Benedict of Aviz, a body of knights founded to emulate the ethos of the Knights Templar. In October 1383, the Portuguese throne nominally passed to ten-year-old Beatrice, but it was her mother and regent, Leonor Tellis, who pulled the strings. Worryingly, Leonor's lover, João Fernández Andera, was a supporter of Castile and had a substantial influence in Beatrice's court. But João of Aviz made his intentions clear when he assassinated Andera a month later. Anti-Castilian elements rallied around him, naming him Protector of the Realm. Seeing his wife's inheritance threatened, King Juan of Castile moved immediately to secure what had been promised to him by Ferdinand I. In March 1384, he dispatched Pedro Alvarez ahead of 5,000 men, mostly cavalry. Crossing into the region of Atoleros, he besieged Frontera. The campaign, however, was met by the young and energetic Nuno Alvarez Pereira. Marching from Lisbon with a thousand men, he collected an additional 600 troops en route. By April, he reached the besieged city. Despite being outnumbered three to one, Nuno made use of the defensive infantry squares to ward off and exhaust the Castilian cavalry charges. A prolonged fight ensued but the Castilians were unable to break the Portuguese resolve. Suffering heavy casualties in futile attacks against the formidable square formations, Pedro Alvarez was forced to withdraw and abandon the siege of Frontera. The stunning victory of Nuno Alvarez hadn't gone unnoticed. For his heroism and leadership, Joao awarded him the title Constable of Portugal thus making him his second in command. The victory at Frontera invigorated the fighting spirit of the anti-Castilian faction and put wind in the sails of Joao's attempt on the Portuguese throne. His prestige hurt, Juan reacted swiftly. Mobilizing a much larger force of over 20,000, the King of Castile went in for the kill by advancing on Lisbon which was not only the vital center of trade and commerce, but also the symbolic seat of Portuguese royalty 
Wan's goal was nothing less than a coronation in the capital, which would secure his legitimacy and sovereignty over Portugal. By the 29th of May 1384, Juan's army encircled and besieged the city, while the Castilian navy blockaded the port. Lisbon was cut off. The siege dragged on for two months, but the resolve of the Portuguese under João of Aviz did not waver, despite widespread famine within the walls and an outbreak of the bubonic plague. By July, calls for help were answered when a Portuguese fleet appeared, with the objective of breaking through the blockade and resupplying the starving capital. They engaged the larger Castilian fleet at the mouth of the Tagus River. The Portuguese lost three ships and their admiral, Hoy Pereira, but the defenders of Lisbon were resupplied. The valiant act of sacrifice by the Portuguese fleet allowed the city to continue its defiance. Meanwhile, Nuno Alvarez Pereira was tasked with harassing the besiegers. But being so vastly outnumbered, all he could do was conduct guerrilla attacks against Castilian supply lines. Juan was forced to introduce rations for the troops, but the siege lines held. It seemed only a matter of time before Lisbon would fall. However, by late July the bubonic plague had spread, engulfing much of the city and the Castilian siege lines. Throughout August, the ravaging pestilence tested the resolve of both the defenders and the besiegers. Finally, Juan abandoned the siege in early September, faced with increasing supply problems and a terrible toll the plague was taking on his troops. While the invaders limped back to Castile to recover, Joao used the respite to begin a diplomatic offensive to try and win support for the Portuguese cause against its much larger neighbor. He attempted to gain the recognition from the Pope, but more importantly, Joao's embassy to the 17-year-old Richard II of England was met with much enthusiasm. Only a minor at the time, the real power lay with his uncle John of Gaunt, first Duke of Lancaster and Regent of England, himself a claimant to the Castilian throne through his wife. At first reluctant, the Duke was eventually persuaded to send troops and reinforce the Portuguese army. The English provided a small but effective force of 200 longbowmen and another 500 volunteers joined from the English-ruled Duchy of Gascony. In total, the English contingent numbered 700 well-trained troops. With his reputation bolstered by the successful diplomatic efforts, Joao arranged the Council of the Kingdom in Coimbra in April 1385. Attended by representatives of the nobility, clergy and the bourgeoisie, the assembly declared him King João I of Portugal, thereby annulling the will of the late King Ferdinand I. After acceding to the throne, João proceeded to take the cities which supported Princess Beatrice's and her husband's claims. This enraged Juan. After regrouping during the winter and spring months in Castile, he again crossed the Portuguese border in July 1385. This time, he would finish the job. As it was the year before, the Castilian objective was to capture the Portuguese capital and thus gain control of the cultural and economic center of the kingdom. There is no reason to believe that Juan was anything less than confident that he would succeed in this objective. His previous siege of Lisbon would have been successful were it not for the outbreak of plague in his army, and he was returning in the new season with an even larger force. Contemporary accounts place the size of his army at 31,000, against which João could field some 6,600 men. Among the Castilian host was a force of no fewer than 2,000 elite French knights, 
These heavily armored cavalrymen were always exceptionally confident in their expertise and keen to show their Ellen and chivalric courage. Their leaders had a place among Juan's inner circle, and this was resented by the Castilian lords. In addition to the French knights, Juan had a force of 6,000 lances, 8,000 crossbowmen, and 15,000 infantry, as well as 15 primitive mortars. Aware of the vast strength of the enemy, Joao had settled on a proactive campaign which would confront and halt Juan's advance before the Castilian king could once more encircle Lisbon and use the Castilian navy to blockade the resupply of the city. Along with the 700 English troops, Joao had at his disposal another 800 crossbowmen, 1,700 lances, and 4,000 infantry. Despite being vastly outnumbered, the Portuguese were confident after repelling the invaders one year earlier and were willing to fight a pitched battle to decide the war and ownership of the Portuguese throne. Understanding that Juan needed to uphold his honor in not avoiding a fight against a much smaller opponent, Joao hoped to lure him into unfavorable ground. To achieve this, he counted on the suggestions of his English allies and the brilliance of Nuno Alvarez to find a strong, defensible position. Interestingly, in a mark of the divided support among the Portuguese for Joao's cause, Nuno's own brother Pedro was serving as commander of Juan's forces. Moving to block the invaders coming from the north, Joao's force took a defensive position on a hill outside Algebahota. Having marched tens of kilometers the previous day, Juan and his army did not arrive at the battle site until noon of the 14th of August. After hearing reports of Joao's position, the King of Castile held a war council. At the meeting, the French counseled an immediate attack, stressing that the Portuguese could catch them in the open when they withdraw to make camp. The Spanish nobles, on the other hand, advised the king to wait and rest his troops after their rushed march, which would give them a full day to rest and deploy, as well as gain additional intelligence on Joao's position and strength. But the discussion quickly devolved into a crass shouting match. Sir Arnold Limousin, whom King Juan chose as his marshal, upbraided the Castilian nobles, first for presuming to know better than the professional French knights in matters of warfare, and second for their timidity in wishing to avoid contact with the enemy. The French hawks made an impression on King Juan. Stirred by their tenacity, he gave orders that the army was to deploy for battle. While they could not yet determine the size of Joao's army, it was clear that the Portuguese were dug in atop a flat hill, with an array of pits, trenches, caltrops, and pickets of stakes prepared on the steep northern slope. Thus, Instead of charging against such a well-prepared position, Juan ordered the army to go around and find a different approach. While this was a prudent decision, two fast-flowing creeks ran alongside the eastern and western sides of the hill, which would make any advance up the sides difficult, and the Portuguese additionally chopped down trees to further block these routes. Attacking through the narrow center along the north-south axis was the only option. Joao and Nuno had their cavalry dismount and take up position in the center alongside the infantry, while the archers and crossbowmen were placed behind the obstacles on the flanks. Nuno took command in the center, while Joao was positioned in the rear with a reserve force and the supply train. But... Having expected to receive the attack on the well-prepared northern slope, when the Portuguese commanders realized that the massive Castilian army was moving around their positions, their hearts sank. They ordered the men to rush to the southern end of the flat hilltop, 
Worryingly, the southern slope was not as steep and was more conducive to cavalry charges. However, King Juan's army was badly divided. Still angered by the discord during the war council, the Castilian nobles secretly agreed that, given the French were so keen to win glory for themselves and show their mettle, they would let them take the first wave and offer them no support during the fight. At some point in the afternoon, Juan's force bypassed the hill where they had come off the road and moved around to its gentler southern side. At first glance, the defenses of the southern slope were much less prepared. There, Juan's army deployed for the attack, with the 2,000 French knights forming the vanguard led by Sir Arnold Limousin, while Juan had answered an appeal by his Castilians to remain with them in the rear, leading the 20,000 strong force. The remainder of the Castilian host was kept in reserve. Joao's army had by now also reversed itself, with the archers and bowmen still on the wings and the infantry forming in the center behind the formerly rear lines of crisscrossed fortifications. Then, down the hill, the French rode into view and led with a full frontal gallop up towards the Portuguese line. Joao's English archers and crossbowmen would have had time to measure their range and lay markers which would tell them when the enemy had entered the killing ground. Once the closely packed French had passed these, a torrent of missiles rained down on them. A skilled English longbowman could fire at least several arrows in a minute. Some estimates give a number as high as 15. And though the several hundred or so Portuguese crossbowmen would have had a slower rate of fire, together their numbers were such that they fired an arrow for every French knight within 30 seconds. Despite the arrow volleys, the French continued to weather the storm, but as they got closer, they were met with both sling missiles from the Portuguese square and the improvised barricades set up by the defenders. The carpet of caltrops pierced the hooves of the horses, causing the animals to pull up and throw their riders, slowing down those behind and creating pileups. English archers and Portuguese crossbows fired point-blank into these stationary mounted targets. Other unfortunate animals would have fallen into trenches hidden from view in the rush and excitement of battle, and all the while, the cavalry would have been funneled, corralled and controlled by the narrow hill between the creeks and the impassable obstacles laid the day and morning before. Running at the center, where the infantry waited with razor-sharp lances to drive into armor and mail. On horseback, Joao urged on his loyal men and allies to defend their ground, but on the Castilian line, Juan's attempts to order his own captains to move in support of the French was met with a staunch refusal. To the king's consternation, his army refused to obey him and left the Frenchmen to fight alone. Remarkably, the French knights reached the Portuguese line despite the punishment they received. A vicious hand-to-hand -hand melee with lances and axes ensued as the heavily armored knights outmatched the Portuguese infantry. They pushed back the lighter armored defenders, but by now less than a thousand French remained. As the day waned and fatigue kicked in, the French knights admitted defeat and were taken prisoner. The Portuguese believed the fighting for the day to be done and welcomed the French noblemen after disarming them promising hospitality while they were awaiting their ransom. Some of the wealthy French knights even ransomed themselves on the spot. In successfully stopping the charge of the armored cavalry, the spirits in the Portuguese line were high. Not taking anything for granted, however, Joao dispatched scouts to report on the movements of Juan and his still enormous Castilian army. 
By now, word reached the King of Castile that his French allies had been thwarted in their storming of the hill, and that many of them were taken hostage. Highly emotional given the rigors of the forced march to the battle site, the insubordination of his commanders in not following his directions, and the uncertainty of the battle itself, Juan decided immediately to launch a second attack on the Portuguese position to rescue his cherished allies. Impressed by their king's resolve, the Castilian nobles were bound by honor to obey the order. Moreover, they saw this as an opportunity to show their own abilities after the failure of the French. But they refused Juan's order to dismount and advance on foot. Instead, the main body of the army, ten times the size of the French attack, moved up the narrow slope. Seeing the massive Castilian charge caused alarm in the Portuguese camp, but crucially, not a panic. Joao quickly realized that having so great a number of captives in the rear of his outnumbered force constituted an unacceptable risk, and he ordered his men, on the pain of death, to kill all of the French prisoners taken in the first assault. This was done with some regret, and the Portuguese then turned to face the oncoming Castilian mass. With the sun setting, some of Juan's advisors again attempted to persuade him to put off the battle until the next day, but the king refused to leave his prisoners, not knowing that they had already been put to death. The Castilian charge followed the same route as the earlier French, keeping close packed order and having to follow the line laid out by the Portuguese barriers and obstacles. Their way was likely hampered even further by the fallen French knights and their animals. Like the French, they nevertheless managed to pass through the storm of arrows, bolts and missiles in enough numbers to engage the Portuguese front line in another savage hand-to-hand -hand fight. While Juan was still on the low ground to the south, with no clear view of the fate of his men, Joao, seeing that the Castilians were starting to break through the Portuguese front line, dismounted and walked to the front along with the Portuguese rear guard, where he personally engaged the Spanish with a poleaxe. In addition, the Castilians attempted to flank the Portuguese, but this was repulsed thanks to the support of the missile troops on the wings. The Castilian force was now trapped amongst the Portuguese square, and with the two wings hemming them in one either side. At the same time, thousands of their own men were coming through the bottleneck at the rear, and allowed no movement backward to gain some breathing room. Juan's position downhill also made any kind of command or restructuring impossible. Many Castilian troops could not reach the top and join the fighting, whilst those at the top were stuck. At dusk, panic overcame the Castilians when the Portuguese showed no signs of conceding. The fight soon became a rout. A full-scale massacre began when the Castilian standard bearer fell. Many thousands of troops alongside the senior nobility perished in the aftermath. Miraculously, a few hundred Castilians did manage to disengage to create a mere tens of meters of distance, and a third assault was launched. But having been successful twice against fresher and braver combatants, the Portuguese grimly held their ground. Their king, Joao, still wielding his axe, launched a limited counterattack of his own, charging after the now fleeing Castilians and cutting down hundreds more in the panic. As night fell, King Juan took a fresh horse and rode straight back towards Santaram, where the full extent of his losses became clear over the next two days. He made his way for Castile shortly thereafter. With command of the army broken down, the scattered and disorganized remains of the Castilian army stumbled towards the border, each man trying to save himself. <laughs> 
Joao prudently halted his army from pursuing the broken Castilians during the night. He maintained his fortified position at Alja Bahorta, while news of the defeat traveled around the countryside. The Portuguese populace turned on the now isolated units of the Castilian army, killing many more while they attempted to reach safety. Joao returned to Lisbon in triumph. He and his army were acclaimed, and he began his reign as uncontested king of independent Portugal. His general Nuno Alvarez Pereira, meanwhile, kept up the pressure on the Castilians, and even led an invasion there in the autumn of 1385, winning the Battle of Valverde despite once more being outnumbered six to one. Joao's victory and reign had a lasting effect not only on Portugal. The next year, his alliance with England was solidified with the Treaty of Windsor still in effect to this day, and now the longest-lasting alliance between two nations in existence. Secondly, and even more significantly for world history, Joao's three sons, Edward, Peter and Henry the Navigator, inherited their father's love of knowledge, science and culture, and initiated the policies that would make Portugal one of the greatest powers on Earth in the coming centuries. If you enjoyed watching, attack the like button and subscribe, and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. Support us on Patreon and get early access to our videos for as little as one dollar, or click the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.